Well, it's wonderful to be continuing John chapter 6. I mean, this chapter alone is completely so full of so much truth that I could probably just go back over and preach chapter 6 in a couple of weeks again. But for now, what we're going to do is we're going to look at individuals, inquiries, and uh, intention, intentional identification. Let me say that again. We're going to look at individuals, inquiries, and intentional identification. Because in this text, what you're seeing is individuals once again challenging Jesus, and he has to once again confirm who he is. He has to satisfy these individuals, tell them the intention of his coming. And this, again, it's a constant theme. And as we go into verses 41 onwards next week, it will continue to be the theme, and it will always be the theme as we close off this book in a couple of years, that John is recording time and time again that though Jesus is making it clear of his divinity and his humanity and the purpose to why he came, it's not good enough. Now, we closed last week with this reminder that Jesus is indeed the most highest, most excellent Lord. And no matter what we are going through, we can look to him. We looked at the fact that he said that he is the uh, ego and me, he is the I am, he is the one who met them on the water, he is the one who controls the storms, he gets into the boat and now the disciples were immediately on the other side of the shore. What we should have taken home last week is that we serve a Lord who leads. He leads us, he teaches us, he strengthens us, he helps our faith and we will always find ourselves better off when we are going through trials. But the reality is as people we always go astray, don't we? And there's probably some of you in this room this morning that have gone astray in your thoughts, in your hearts. Maybe you're overshadowed by some concerns. For some, whatever reason, you're having this false image of, of Christ in your head. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at this misconception that unbelievers even had with Jesus. And how even his disciples sitting there listening to this language are able to just bring their minds back to the reality of who he is. Because what we're going to notice is that these individuals who were on the one side, who ate of the loaves, who ate of the fish, who went to the sea, found out the boats were missing, so they travel as well. They now find themselves back with Jesus. No, I doubt all 5,000 plus family members were at this location, but there were quite a few who were there previously. And they're still asking the wrong questions. In fact, in John 6, 25, it says, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? That's a wrong question in the presence of Jesus, I think. In verse 28, they asked, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? In verse 30, they asked, what then do you do for a sign, so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate of the man in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them the bread to eat, out of heaven to eat. That's an interesting question. Like, these are the people that just watched Jesus turn five loaves and fish into enough to feed a multitude of men. But they asked it, and in verse 34 they say a statement, not a question, Lord, give us this bread. And so from the start of what's happening here consistently is Jesus is correcting the wrong perspective, and he has to continue to show them, stop thinking in the temporal sense. Stop thinking in this fleshy mindset of the here and now. Start thinking in the eternal Start thinking of matters of salvation. Start looking to what the Father is doing. But from time and time again, they consistently always think of the here and now. Now Jesus says something else huge here. In our text this morning, we read that the sinner can't even. The sinner can't even be saved. The sinner cannot even believe unless the Father makes it so. So, it was missed. The Father supplied the manna from heaven. Did he not? The Father provides the Son. The Father provides the true bread of life. Not just our salvation, but the sustainer of our life. The spiritual weight of humanity has been solved. So let's just go to the first point. And the first point is interesting inquiries. Interesting inquiries. Let's read verses 26 and 27. Jesus 
answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father, God, has set his seal. Now I love the fact that here Jesus is not answering the question of how did you get here? He's not worried about their small little inquisitions of of wondering how the boat left and now all this is taking place. Jesus is getting right into the heart of the matter and he's doing a very serious examination because the motives of these individuals are being publicly made known. They're coming after Jesus and they're following him because of the food in their bellies. Now, we've read previously that people followed Jesus because of the signs that he performed. If that doesn't represent the modern-day church, I don't know what it is. If you think about the modern evangelicalism, people follow Jesus for signs and wonders and have their bellies filled. But when it comes time to living a holy life, comes time to dying to self, fighting sin, living righteously, no, we don't want any of that. Just fill our bellies and give us provision. It's quite interesting. These people saw the miracle. These individuals saw a great miracle on the other side when those loaves of fish and when the bar, sorry, the loaves of barley and those fish were transformed and were able to feed a multitude of people. They weren't just witnesses of this miracle. It's not like they could just shoot on their Christian television station and have some reporter going, This just in. Some guy turned five fish and five loaves of bread into enough to fill the multitude and they're watching this spectacle unfold before their eyes many of these individuals were sitting on that very grass eating the very loaves and the fish that jesus provided so what's going on see jesus has to deal with something because don't forget these are the individuals that tells us previously after that miracle after what took place they wanted to take jesus by if you remember it tells us in verse 15 that they wanted and they want to take jesus by uh, force they wanted to make him a king hmm isn't that interesting why is that interesting friends because they're thinking temporary they're thinking temporary that they want to make him king now They need a solution now. They want to act now. And so many Christians do this day in and day out. Something's going on. We want it fixed now. Jesus is not going to give them what they want right now. He is Messiah. He is King. He is sovereign. He is all of those things. But they don't get to have him now in this earthly king to defeat Rome in the way that they are thinking. Not at all. Jesus makes sure he leaves them, he withdraws from them, he goes to a place to pray, and then all of last week's sermon, which was already preached for you, takes place. But that's a big rebuke. It's a big rebuke because Jesus saying, you saw the signs. You should already have this in your hearts and your minds already. This should be solidified in you you're not getting it. And that's what verse 27 of chapter 6 is about. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. They're, they're seeking things that are going to perish. They are seeking things that will not last. Things that simply will fade away. And dear brothers and sisters, do not all of us do this very thing? We acquire ourselves all these trinkets of life and all these little fancy gadgets that are going to fade away. And we 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 want to buy all these things, thinking they're going to make us holier and better. And for men, many of us, what do we do? We buy a library and we stack up our books so we look smart and intelligent and we look like look how much temporary knowledge that we have. But it perishes, it is worthless, just like the food perishes and is worthless. Why? Because food spoils. Food gets moldy. And all these people wanted was to fill their stomachs. 
Friends, they're going to Jesus to fill a temporary need. What about you? Do you go to Jesus for a temporary need? Is he a distant second in your life? So much so that you have no thought of Christ at all until all of a sudden you need something in your belly? So you run to him with a half-empty prayer coming off your lips hoping to be satisfied? You see, the text is telling us something very deep here that Jesus offers so much more. Jesus is so higher, so better. It is so amazing. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3 starts to allude to this. And he humbled you, and he let you be hungry, and he fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but everything that proceeds out of the mouth of Yahweh. Even back in, in the days of Moses, the whole purpose of the manna was to teach the congregation to live and trust in the word of God. And if God says he's going to do something, he is faithfully able to do it, but he still out of compassion provides the manna. The manna is simply to show, in a complete paraphrase of Pastor Steve, I've got this. But they didn't understand. And Jesus' followers here at this moment, they don't understand because humans are fickle. We forget so quickly. We, we always aim to heap up things here and now. And we don't look to the end goal. We don't look to the fact that all of us here have an eschatological hope if you are in Jesus Christ. If you are in Christ, you have a hope because we are not living for the now. We don't care about who's in Ottawa. We don't care who's at Queen's Park. We don't care about our bank accounts because there's a day coming, and it's coming, friends, that Christ is going to do exactly what he said he's going to do, and we will be glorified. But we get sidetracked. We start to doubt. We start to labor. And many labor for things that will perish. Jesus has no interest on satisfying a temporary need at this moment. And that's the problem. Christianity has been infiltrated so much so by the most heretical filthiness of the prosperity gospel. And that people think then that it's all about their best life now. And some of you, on your bookshelves, even right now, may have those authors. And you will read the Joyce Myers and the Joel Osteens. And God forbid it be so, but some of you might even have Kenneth Copeland on your bookshelves. And what you think is that if you acquire enough wealth, and enough health in this present age, then it will be satisfactory for something eternal. And in your minds and in your hearts, you are seeking something that is so secondary to the majesty and the worth of Jesus Christ. Because what is going on here, he's telling these people, stop thinking about the now. It's not about your best life now. It's not about Messiah coming to set up an earthly kingdom now, to destroy Rome now, and to be seated now so that you guys can be free from the oppression of the Romans. It's not about best life now. In fact, in Matthew... Chapter 6, verse 19, it states, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. That car you drive right now is going to be a rust bucket. It's going to be in the junkyard one day. Your brand new computer will be a paperweight. Your nice suit will be nothing but rags. What Jesus is saying is, get your minds off the now. Pursue life. True life, eternal life. Pursue the true bread, the true food. That's what this whole point is getting at. It connects right back to this, again, the temporary versus the eternal. They want a now kingdom. Jesus' kingdom is forever. It's not a temporary. He tells us in Matthew 6, but seek for his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. First seek the kingdom. First seek righteousness. 
And so we get to the point about working for food that endures into eternal life. It is only what the Son of Man can actually give. Work out these things. Work out your faith. Pursue righteousness. Pursue Christ because he is life. Friends, I don't know how much more I can be clear on this. Your hearts will stop one day. Your lungs will no longer breathe air. Your eyes will get dim. Your hair will turn gray. You will die. If the Lord does not come back, they will take your body and they will put it into the ground. Everything you've ever saved up for will be gone. Your, your tax receipts, who cares? Your RSPs given to your kids, which will probably waste that money away anyway. Your employer will go, oh, we lost Sally on Friday, but you'll be replaced on Monday. Those who weep for you will no longer weep, and the world will continue on. But yet we look to this world to find our, our all in all, but Christ is our all in all. He doesn't want us to worry about the here and the now, but the eternal, because he's life. That's where life is. In 1 John 5.20 it says, And we know the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so we may know Him who is true and we are in Him who is true. In His Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. There's no life in your possessions. There's no life in your tax-free savings account. There's no life in your church membership. There's no life in being a Presbyterian or a Baptist. If you do not know Jesus Christ as Savior, you have no life and you are simply nothing more than a zombie walking around with no life in your body and you collect all of this stuff that moth and rust will co collect and it will corrupt and you're going to leave it in this filthy world and you are still just as dead as when you started. But in Christ there is life. In Christ you can breathe. In Christ you can walk. In Christ is how you are able to even sufficiently think straight. And they're missing it. You know, their contention is that they think, they're saying that, you know what, Jesus, back to the text, you, they're saying, Jesus, you're, you're claiming to be something more than you really are. Why do you think they use the example of Moses? In their estimation, Moses is greater than Jesus. They're like, Moses fed way more people than you did. And they're failing to understand that Jesus is the one who is the true source of eternal life. He's already taught this lesson in the presence of his disciples. In chapter 5, verse 17, he said, My father is working, and I am working. In 519, the son could do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the father doing. 520, the father shows the son all things. 524, he who believes will have eternal life. In 526, just as the father has life in himself, even so he gave to the son also to have life in himself. Jesus is not just one who gives life, he is life. So dear friends, what are you chasing are you chasing church membership? Are you chasing the better car, the better career? Guys, are you just chasing the girl? And you think that you're a Christian now because some girl got your eyesight. Now you're going to church. She doesn't give you life. Is it your marriage that you think is giving you life? If I just get married and become a member of the church, I'll have, none of it will be sufficient. Because Jesus is life, he only can be life. You have no life outside of Christ. So it means if you're living for any other thing, any other person, you're on a one-way ticket to hell. Amen. So Jesus is the one that the Father set his seal. That should be enough for them. He's saying to these people, the Father has set his seal upon me. I and the Father am one. The only paraphrase, and this is not what's written in the text, but the only paraphrase I can come up with is that if he was looking at somebody, he's like, do you not get it? You're looking at God. 
That's the only way I could find a way to paraphrase this. The one that is now working in their presence. He doesn't just, he didn't just take care of their need when he turned the bread and the fish into a bounty. It points to the end. Everything that Jesus is telling him, he is the end aim. He is the end promise. It's that eschatological hope, friends. Think about the weight of that statement. If all of a sudden you heard air sirens go off, and you're, all of a sudden a nuke is about to hit this country, half the churches would run around scrambling like a bunch of cockroaches that the lights just got turned on out of sheer panic because they have so much devotion and love to this world, they are concerned on how to preserve it. We have Christians who are looking right now on the news worried about what's going on with the Zionists and what's going on with Russia. They're buying land up north and buying guns and and safety kits and military rations to somehow preserve their life. They are clearly not seeing that the eschatological hope that we have in the future is we get God. Our bodies will die, but they will be resurrected. We will be perfected in the presence of Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever and ever. And if that's not long enough and ever, no more death, no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more shame. And we will never exhaust knowing who he is. We will never exhaust our worship with him. This is the promise he gives us for all of eternity. But these people want to be filled with a little bit of bread. What about you? Is that all you want? Just a little piece of bread? Let's go to point two. Individual inadequacies. We're going to read verses 28 through 31. Therefore they said to him, what should we do so that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, what then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? (laughs) Really? Have you anybody ever underlined that in your Bible? Like, are you serious? Are you kidding me now, people? Verse 31. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Oh, wow. They're now quoting scripture to call out the Lord, eh? If you are someone who trusts in your works, you are indeed in trouble. Friends, we don't trust our works, do we? We don't trust our merit. But we do trust the work of another, do we not? You see... There's a saying that confuses a lot of people, but it's true if you actually think about what I'm about to say. You are saved by works. The finished work of Jesus Christ. Not yours. There's no work that they can do. So Jesus rebukes their thinking again. He rebukes them on this thought process that they just can't seem to comprehend. So many individuals rest in their own ability or their mo- they think that their desire or their thought process is sufficient enough. As if their good intentions are okay and adequate. Not for our Lord. These people are religious. You know how we know that? Because they were able to quote scripture. If you have a LSB, a legacy standard, or a NASB, you would see that that was all capitalized. That's showing you that there was an Old Testament reference being made. But they were religious. They had ceremonies. You don't think the Jewish people had ceremonies? The feasts? In fact, the Jewish people were more dedicated to Scripture and raising their families than half the men we have in this country. They actually read for their children. They actually prayed for their children. They actually took their children to church. So these people were religious. They had a system, a belief system. They followed the rules of the teachings. But it wasn't sufficient. Friends, religion doesn't save. 
Religion doesn't save. Calling yourself a Christian means nothing. I can call myself a forward for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Sounds nice, but it doesn't mean it's true. You can go to church, you can pay your tithe, you can be a member, you can serve as an usher or a deacon. Man, you can be a pastor. But if you think it's religion that is going to keep you, you're in big trouble. Back in John 5, 29, Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. You see, that's very, very important. Sorry, did I say five? Yeah, good, know your Bibles. Six. Jesus makes it clear what pleases the Father. It's belief in Him. It's belief in Him. It's to have faith in Christ. My dear friends, He's not worried about empty professions. He has no care for empty phrases. We serve a great prophet, priest, and king. What can we offer him who has given us all things? What kind of religious service can we do to honor the Lord? One from a pure heart and a broken and contrite spirit, I would say. But let's move on. Malachi 3.1. It's a reference verse. Behold, I am going to send my messenger... And he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says Yahweh of hosts. The conversation that's going back and forth between the Jews and Jesus and the other people who are present is somewhat amusing. Verses 30 to 31, let's just reread that. They said to him, what do you do for a sign that we may say, uh, that we may see and believe what work do you perform and again they quote the scripture that our fathers gave them br- uh, bread from heaven we can see then that they're actually using scriptures to almost challenge jesus how many of you done that when a well-meaning Christian says, you know, the Bible says that all sexually immoral, all liars, all thieves, and they will not you know, partake in the kingdom of heaven. You say, yeah, but what about this verse? What about that verse? These are the unbelieving religious friends. They're the unbelieving religious that probably fill up a majority of our churches across the land. The quote was easy for them to put out, but they could not apply it to their lives. Verse 32 and 33 says, Then Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Moses has not given you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread, uh, for the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They missed it. They missed it. He's setting their minds straight. He's getting their minds off themselves. He's telling them very carefully, listen, I don't care what you think about Moses. Moses did nothing in his own power. It was always through the Father. The Father is what provided them the bread in the, desert, in the wilderness. It is the Father who sustained their life, and it's the Father who has sent me the true bread of life before you this very day, and you still don't get it. Do you think it was Moses that made the manna? Do you think it was Moses that provided the quail? Do you think it was Moses that struck the rock the first time in obedience and brought forth water? No mortal can do such a thing. It has always been the Father who has given the provision. And Jesus is saying here now, listen, the Father has provided the provision for salvation. It is God who feeds you spiritually. Stop looking to Elijah who can feed a hundred men. Stop looking to Moses who fed the congregation in the wilderness. Have faith in the Son who is in your presence now. Because the Father is doing something great here. 
goes back to that verse, chapter 3. For God so loved the world, he gave his son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Why won't they perish? Because it's eternal. Now comes the issue. Now comes the big issue, because they have so much in common with so many people today. And that is the issue of the false religion. The false misunderstanding. As I said, man is spoils. You know that, right? So when you read the, the account of the barleys and the, and, the, and the fish, you know that that food, if it wasn't collected, it would have spoiled. Good. Because all religion spoils. All religion spoils. Look at the corruption of the Roman Catholic Church. Religion. Look at all the wars of Islam. This, this religion of peace that every time somebody says something about their prophet or their God, they got to act out in the flesh and pick up military arms and defend their God. My God doesn't need no man to defend him. But look how corrupt it is. Look at the Anglican Church. The United Church. Look how corrupt that's becoming with the switching over of a going against the very word of God and saying, you know what? God doesn't know as much as we know. So we're just going to ordain men and women that are not qualified, in fact, disqualified from Scripture because we know better than God. And all these people are trying to find their way to God. And you know people every day of your life. You encounter them at the grocery stores, the coffee shops, the funeral homes, the hospitals. And they're trying to make their way to God. And you have the answer. They say, if I just pray harder, serve more, dress better means nothing that's why we have a lot in common with these people because they're trusting in a system that's no longer sufficient listen Judaism is not the oldest religion in the world Judaism as we know it is dead what is going on with the Jews around the world are individuals who have rejected the Messiah and they have spat in the face of the living God and said, we will not accept your provision of salvation. And so there is no more Judaism. Who are they worshiping? Not the Father. You cannot worship the Father and deny the Son. And we have all these people looking to Israel right now as if it's the Holy Land and they defy and spit in the name of God. But Jesus is providing a better way. He, right here in the scriptures, is making it very, very clear. I give a better way. Powerful. It's greater than Moses. It's greater than Elijah. It's greater than Solomon's temple. It's greater than Herod's temple. It's greater than the Maccabean War. It's greater than anything you can possibly ever imagine. Dear brothers and sisters, do we comprehend this? That you and I were rebellious sinners towards a holy God, and he had every right to destroy us where we stand, to turn us into ashes and dust, to wipe Canada off the face of the map, every country destroyed. But he offers us life. In the life of his son, Jesus Christ. We deserve death, but we get life. We deserve judgment, but we get grace and mercy. And the Jews here, these Jewish people, it's not anti-Semitism. You're in the wrong church if you think that's what it is. The Jewish people here cannot comprehend it. They're looking at the shadow of things, just like Muslims do, just like Buddhists do, just like Hindus do. They're looking at all the superficial, temporary, external things. But Jesus is saying it's way better because he's indeed the bread of heaven. He's the bread of heaven. I don't have time to go into the, 
to the Old Testament analogies of that. But there is an Old Testament, New Testament connection. He is not just the true bread, he is the living water. Not only does whoever eats this bread will never hunger again, whoever drinks will never thirst again. And then when I look around the world, all I see is people hungry and thirsty. Spiritually. Now, some of you are probably still held up on that old Israel remark. So let's deal with it. You answer the question. Does Israel right now as a nation on this planet of rock and spinning around in space worship Jesus Christ? Yes or no? Answer aloud. Have confidence in your answer. No. If you do not worship Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. If you do not worship Jesus Christ, do you have eternal life? No. Because the only people that worship Christ are those who are saved by Christ. So let's stop putting our hope in Israel. That's what I'm driving at. Let's stop looking at what's going on in the news to see if Jesus is coming back. And let's get our eschatology back to be Christocentric, focused on the Lord. Because he offers something better. It'll make sense in a minute if you're still lost. If not, we record these on YouTube. You can watch it over and over and over again. It's amazing. People take some of our videos and they crop them and they put things out of context. It's an awesome thing you can do online now. I got to tie this up, but let's go verses 34 to 36. Then he said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Let's just stop there. You guys see the issue with that? They said, give us the bread. He tells them that he's the bread and they still reject it. It's like so many people in church say, isn't it? Pastor, what can I do to be saved? Trust Jesus Christ. Yeah, no, I'm not doing that. I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. That is a weight. How many times have people walked into a church and they've encountered the living God through the preaching faithfully of the word and they still do not believe that should cause us to tremble they didn't just want bread they just wanted temporary bread their answer is like the woman at the well sir give me this water so I don't have to come back to this well again. She was focused on something temporary. And it's a humanity's problem ever since. We only are working on the temporary. And the scripture is clear that man can't live by bread alone. We need Jesus. We need the word. John 6, 35, he said to them, I am the bread of life. The ego, ego and me again, right? The I am, this is the first of seven. He's the bread of life, and whoever comes after him will not. Jesus is not giving some empty promises here. The text does not say, whoever comes to me might not be hungry again. Whoever comes after me might be satisfied. He answers the question, you will not be hungry. And you will not thirst. Friends, that means your appetites for this world will be gone. Nothing in this world is going to want you to crave the filthy pollution. When we're feasting on Christ, when we're full on Christ, when we have had our spiritual condition remedied, It goes back to what he says in Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. It goes back to what was said in Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 4. 
Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you have, if you have no money, come. Buy and eat. Come. Buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight your soul in riches. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that your soul may live. And I will cut an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful loving kindness of David. They got it wrong. And the Jews to this day still have it wrong. And here's the tie-in. And you might be going, well, how can they be having it wrong for this many thousands of years? Probably for the same reason why many Christians can sit in church for decades and still have it wrong. Takes me into the verse 36. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. That is the rejection. It is the rejection of the Father's provision. Fathers in this room, if you gave your child, or your son, your 1968 Dodge, decked right out, Hemi, A-Track, you got the Bee Gees in there, all right, I'm getting you, you're laughing, and you give this free to your son, and your son goes, thanks for the car, Dad, and flicks out a loony and gives it to you and says, I don't want you to give me anything. I'll pay for it. How insulted would you be? How insulting do you think the insulted the father is when we sit there and tell him that his provision is not sufficient enough? And we reject what he has given us as a free gift and even go more arrogantly say, Here's a buck. Thanks for, the, thanks for the offer. That's what's going on here. They're rejecting God. They would rather be in the dark in their evil ways than come to the light. In verse 37, it says, All the Father gives me will come to me. And the ones who come to me I will certainly not cast out. You know why they didn't believe? They weren't called. Their eyes were not open. That's the reason why so many people can sit under the preaching of the word for so many years and still be dead in their sins. This is why so many people in church can walk in on a Sunday after having a massive drinking binge on a Friday and Saturday, cussing people out, cursing and swearing, and even be deacons and elders. Because unless the Father calls, there is no life. This word becomes complicated, so we are going to go slow. And the kids are being very well behaved. Moms, don't worry. It's not loud. Do you notice that one thing's happening in this text? I'm just... Jesus is walking up to them and being very direct with them. Is he not? Right? Nowhere in this text you say, but please accept me into your heart. Please. I'm the bread of life. You have a me-shaped hole in your life. Just, would you just accept me? And I'll make it all better. He's not doing this, friends. Not only does he say that you don't believe, he's telling them very clearly the reason why you don't believe is because only those the Father gives me will come. He's already telling them, you're damned. And the reason why you don't come is because you don't know the Father. You think you know the Father. You think that you're spiritually okay. You think you're religious. No, you don't know the Father because my Father doesn't know you. All that the Father gives to me, they will come to me. Right here. It, I can't, all that, let, let's just do some exegetical work for a moment. Get comfortable. All, past, so all, a large sum, the determinative sum, all. That the Father, meaning God, gives me a gift given over, handed over, provided to, gives me, will come to me. 
We got some tax stuff here going on. That will means they will. Here, big Greek lesson, will means will. It's going to happen. They're coming. And the one who comes to me, uh-oh, I'm going to get some Armenians mad here. I will never cast out. The king of glory never begs any sinner to accept him. Resolve that right now. The king of glory steps down. And the father gives the effectual call. He is the initiator, as it were. And the son, in his perfect obedience, comes and lays his life down for every single one of God's sheep. And the Holy Spirit, excuse me, I misspoke earlier, gives the effectual call. Awake. Come. Live. Oh, Jesus doesn't need us to accept him into our heart. What kind of foolish nonsense, Baptist, old school theology is that? As if he needs a finite creature to determine his worth, his majesty, his glory. He's the bread of life. If you're a Christian in this room this morning, the verse also means this. You're going to reach your destination. What, your sin is greater than his grace? Our catastrophic mess-ups are somehow more powerful than the eternal redeeming love of the Father who sent his Son? Oops, we didn't get a passage right? He's, he's done with us? What he's saying here in these verses is absolutely outstanding over the sovereignty of God and how he is able to gather his children and to sustain them and to feed them and to love them. Some hear the effectual call and some remain deaf. And Jesus is making it very clear. And what he's saying to them right now is this. You're mistaken. You don't believe me because the Father hasn't revealed it to you. Your rejection of me is because you're a sinner. And you're dead in your sins. Now for some of you who are in this room are struggling right now, How do I know I'm saved then? How do I know I'm one of God's elect? What if I'm not? Those very questions prove that you probably are. He doesn't tell us or show us who has the big E stamped on the forehead. He tells us to preach the gospel to everyone, equally, always, forever. But we must come to grips with this. Jesus is making it very clear. The ones whom the Father has determined to come to him will indeed come to him. Ephesians 1, 4 and 5, just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him in love by predestining us to adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So then... I don't care if Israel has rejected the Messiah. It doesn't change who he is. He's still God. How can I say that? Look at the verse, Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. Who chose us? He did. Who did he choose? Us. How did he choose us? In Christ. When did he choose us? Before the foundations of the world. Why were we chosen? To be holy and blameless before him. How was this done? Again, in Christ. So what is the process in all this? By predestining us to to adoptions as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ to himself. 
And why did the Father do it? To the praise of his goodwill and pleasure. So if you're saved here this morning, you better be grateful. First Peter 1, 2 says, According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to the obedience of Jesus Christ, and to the sprinkling of his blood, may grace be multiplied to you. And if you're still struggling with this, he's going to make it even more clear in John 6, 65, when he says, For this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him from the Father. My dear saints, my brethren and sisters in Christ, he has pulled us from the pit of death and has given us life. And has provided us every, every sustenance that we need in this spiritual journey. He is the bread of life. He is the living water. He is the all in all. He is in all. What is it that do we need? Nothing. And the ones who are challenging him here are showing nothing more than a dead, stubborn heart. And so when you run into people who pose these questions to you, you are dealing with people who are dead, stubborn of heart you don't need to beg them you preach faithfully to them you plea with them you don't beg them big difference i need to wrap this up we have communion so what are some reflection points that we can look at why do you believe why are you a christian I want you to seriously reflect on this. Why are you a Christian? Because you grew up in a Christian home? She's okay here. But are you a Christian because you grew up in a Christian home? Because you're a church member? Because you're a Baptist? You watched a Billy Graham crusade? The only reason why you're a Christian or I'm a Christian is because the Father has called us by name and has plucked us out of this world and has bestowed upon us his most marvelous grace. That's the only reason why you're a Christian. Before nothing existed, the Father eternally decreed your salvation. He determined exactly what he was going to do. The redemption of sinners. You need to think this through very carefully before we do communion. The Jews had a relationship with Yahweh for many, many years. And they rejected his son. Is it possible some of you have rejected the son? They knew the scriptures and they rejected Christ. They celebrated in Passover and rejected the true Passover lamb. They went to the Feast of Booths and the Feast of Lights. And they rejected the fulfillment of all things. Do not leave this church thinking just because you got your butt into a chair this morning that you actually might be a Christian. Examine yourself carefully to see whether you are in the faith. To, indeed, to see if you meet that test. Salvation is not optional or possible with our God. It's factual. It's certain. So as you examine this in your heart, he will give you the assurance and he will show you your sin. He will show you your failures and he will continue to strengthen you. But if you are not a Christian here today 
or online, you will be awakened to your need of a great Savior. God does not reveal all his mysteries to us in his timing, nor does he tell us or show us who is and who is not going to be saved. What he tells us is to preach the gospel to every creature in season and out of season. What he tells us is to go and to preach and to baptize, to make disciples. That is what he tells us. And what we learn from the last portion of this text is about the foreknowledge of God and the finished work of his, of his son. I pray you could come to grips with this truth, my dear friends. And I'm not trying to harp on election so strongly as this last point. Many, many people say that God is not fair in what he does. And some have read this text and have preached this text by saying it's not fair. But who are we, O oh man, to answer back to God? This text drives us redeemed saints to behold the most glorious Savior and to see our sin as the most putrid thing because it keeps us from Him. The Father loves the Son and gives all things into the Son's hands. And the Son loves the Father. And that love has been extended to his elect.